welcome, thank you. Ladies' night tonight, when our guests are three of Australia's most famous and talented female performers, all from popular television soap operas. From Sons and Daughters, the woman the public loves to hate, Pat the Rat, Miss Rowena Wallace. From Carson's Law, via the Sullivans, where she became everyone's ideal mum, Miss Lorraine Bailey. But first up, someone who's been a favourite with Australian audiences since the early 60s, when she was every bloke's favourite pin-up and every woman's idea of glamour. At present, she's found a new kind of popularity as Shirley Gilroy in a country practice. She's, of course, Lorraine Desmond. Before I talk to Lorraine, let's have a reminder of how she started in the business as a singer and entertainer. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Lorraine Desmond. I live the life of a millionaire. Spending my money. I didn't care Taking my friends out For a mighty good time Buying them champagne, gin and wine But then I began to fall so low I couldn't find my friends Had no place to go If I ever get my hands on a dollar Again. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to squeeze it until the emu grin. That's not shall lose. So the Bible says, and it still is news. Mama may have, and Papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. That's got his own. Rich relations may give you a crust of bread and such. Well, you can help yourself, but don't take too much. Cause mama may have, and papa may have, but God bless the child that's got his own. That's got his own Cause when you got money You got lots of friends Hanging around your door But when the money's gone And all your spending ends They won't be round anymore No Back. My guest is Miss Lorraine Desmond. Lorraine, uh, interested to read in fact that Lorraine Desmond is not your real name. Beryl Hunt is your real name. Yes, I was born Beryl Hunt, Pioneer Street, Mitigal. Mm -hmm. hmm. And how so, did Beryl become. Well, Lorraine? when I first uh, left school, which was very. I left school at 14. That was the age you were allowed to leave, so I thought it was a good idea. I wasn't learning anything there. So I left school and uh, went into hairdressing, and there was a girl called Lorraine there. 
And I wanted to go into a talent quiz, but my family didn't really approve of show business, so I thought I'd, uh, I'd use another name to uh, say making an idiot of myself in front of them, you see. So I, I asked this girl if I could borrow her name, Lorraine, and I put my father's Christian name, Desmond, after it, and uh, it stuck, you know? So all these years later, I've still got her name. What about her? What about the original Lorraine? Oh, we should probably change name to Beryl. <laughs> <laughs> no, doubt it. You were, in fact, as you said, you, were, you really always wanted to be an entertainer, didn't you? In fact, you made a, a list, didn't you, of things that you wanted to do when you were a child? Well, when I left Australia to go to England, I made a list of all the things I wanted to do. I'd been uh, a singing cigarette girl at a club called the Celebrity Club when I was terribly young. So I made this list of things I wanted to do when I got to England, and uh, they included all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Like, like I wanted my own television show, I wanted my own radio show, I wanted to have my own recording contract. I mean, you know, no experience uh, at all, but I wanted all that. And uh, the list went on forever. Work in the top nightclubs, do summer season, pantomime. And, um, of course, I had to fulfil this list. Mm -hmm. and what was the reality, though, when you got to England? Oh, nobody wanted to know. No, of course not. No, of no. course not. So I went for an audition at uh, a place called Week Studios, and there was no piano player either, as a matter of fact. He said, what are you going to sing? I said, oh, I'll sing, indeed I do. So I hit a note and sang it all by myself. He said, right, OK, you're, you're hired. I said, well, what am I going to do? He said, a week in Scunthorpe at the Bluebell Hotel. <laughs> Seven pounds for the week and you pay your own fee. Really? Oh. Scunthorpe. Scunthorpe. Oh, what a place to start. Oh, it's a punishment. That's not a gig. Uh, well, the weird thing was, you see, that I didn't know. I had all these glamorous dresses. Yeah. So I had this tight silver lame dress that you could hardly walk in, and an apple green satin, which you could hardly walk in. So, of course, I was mincing onto this stage and singing all these brackets with these men with flat caps on and beer mugs looking at me in amazement. When I'd finished the final bracket of the night, this, this voice piped up, E. You don't come from Scunthorpe, do you? <laughs> <laughs> you did, did you cultivate this sort of sexy image at the time? Oh, no, not really. I think it was just the fact that everybody wore very tight dresses, and if you happen to have more lumps than anybody else, <laughs> you look sexier. Did you send it up, though? I mean, did you? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, what's serious about sex? Uh, that's a very good question. Are you asking uh, me? Yes. Do you think it's funny? Yes. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> we should get together. It is. <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> but we'd laugh a lot, wouldn't we? We would indeed, yes. <laughs> Nothing much else would happen, but we'd laugh a lot. <laughs> that's right. But in what way? I mean, uh, you know, I suppose that it's, it's actually... It adds to the joke, isn't it? There's somebody on stage who looks incredibly glamorous and then says, says something that's totally out of character. Well, mm. yes, of course. I mean, I, I think anyone who really takes himself seriously as far as sex is concerned mm. is, A, not entertaining and not funny. And to me, the, the greatest seller of sex with humour, uh, she just kills me, and even now, is Lena Horne. Mm. I mean, she can sell sex, but you know it's all just tongue-in-cheek and she's not serious about any of it, mm. really. Do you think we take sex too seriously now? It's one of my favourite subjects. Do you think that we take sex too seriously? I don't, Michael, do you? No, 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 we've just gone through that. Oh, but, I mean, do you, think, do you think, generally speaking, we do? Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, written about it, you know, in magazines and things, and I don't know why they keep repeating the same things that I found out a long time ago. Really? Mm. Nothing new under the sun? Well, there isn't, is there? No. I mean, oh, well, I just talked about more, I guess. Yes. The same old thing, isn't it? <laughs> you find it easy to give up? Oh, yes. I can give up sex, I can give up uh, eating, I can give up drinking, but I can't give up cigarettes. You can't? No, and it's, it's a bit of a worry, because the character I'm playing in the show has given up smoking. So, of course, I walk down the street, I think, oh, I'd love a cigarette. So I'll go behind a corner and have a bit of a puff, and some little kid comes up and says, you're not supposed to smoke anymore, ha huh? <laughs> Frank's go I'm going to tell Frank on you. I go, oh. <laughs> and they're right, I shouldn't. What kind of reaction do you get? I and mean, this is an entirely new phase in your career, isn't it, playing this sort of uh, part in, uh, in, yes. the, in the series, in a successful series to boot? I mean, what kind of reaction do you get? Oh, it's wonderful. It mm. really is. Letters from, from so many different kinds of people. What kind of letters are they, though, in the main? Uh, well, I get letters from little tiny kids, yeah. um, uh, you know, sort of saying, I wish I had a mum like you. <laughs> really? They realise they've probably got a much better mum than I'd ever be. But, uh, and also uh, asking advice, uh, telling me that I pull... They love the way my head goes up and down. <laughs> now, that's an ex Truly, because I apparently have a habit, which I don't know I do, and my forehead shoots up and down. They write to me a lot about 
my head going up and down. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go back to, to what we were talking about, about the when, when you were after Scunthorpe, but you're still, uh, everything was after Scunthorpe. <laughs> Yes. Um, anything after Scunthorpe is worth talking about. <laughs> you were, you were, you were in fact in this this stage where you were you're singing, entertaining, and you're this very sort of glamorous image. You still are glamorous, but Thank then you were you. different kind of glamour. I'm getting myself into a terrible spot here. I can see, but anyway. How different? Uh, well, uh, well, we're going to see how different. That's oh. Oh, well done, Parky. Oh. Now, because here we've got we've got a tape of you <laughs> with one of the great entertainers of the world, who you had a uh, you worked with quite a bit. Mr. Jack Benny. Just let's have a look at this. This was in the 60s, I Ray, think. Ray, tell it? me, how would you compare Australia with the United States? Well, Jack, it's quite difficult to compare the two. You see, in Australia, we have acres and acres of sheep ranches. Well, uh, we have that here in America, too. We have sheep ranches, you know. Well, uh, we have the Sydney Harbour which is supposed to be one of the most beautiful harbors in the world. Well, I, I saw it, and I must admit you're right, but in San Francisco, we have a harbor, Lorraine, that's, that's hard to beat. I see. Well, Jack, we have one thing in Australia that you haven't got. What's that? In Melbourne, we have kangaroos that can jump 20 feet in the air. Oh, yeah? Well, in Los Angeles, we've got pedestrians that would make them look like nothing. I just did 18 feet on my way to work this morning. You enjoy working with him? Oh, he was a very great man. Mm. A very generous, mm. loving man. He was great. I just adored him. Mm. Mm. I once asked him the daftest question I've ever asked anybody. I said, you're renowned for your pauses, your timing. What's the longest pause you've ever held? <laughs> and five minutes later, he was still looking at me. It was terrifying. It was amazing. He just turned and turned. Of course, the audience went with him. He was a very, very great comedian, actually. Oh, I think one of the greatest. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about the, the work that you did um, when you went over to Vietnam, because that interests me. I mean, you went over there, what, about five or six times, yeah, didn't you? Six times. The troops. It was really fascinating. Mm -hmm. I mean, troop audiences are the best in the world anyway. And I had done a lot of, uh, a lot of troop entertaining in England for the war office and all sorts of weird and wonderful places that you certainly wouldn't go to. Mm. I mean, they don't have any Hiltons or anything, really. Mm. Um, but Vietnam was, was fascinating because, um, well, I don't know, it was a, just a very strange war, was a bit strange. But having gone six times, you could see the difference over that period and the changing attitudes of the people to Australians as well as to Americans. Mm. Uh, oh, it was fantastic fun, you know. There was one time there, you know, I wore this slinky silver dress really slinky silver dress, went out this sea of faces and, uh, and of course, they all went, woo, and carried on like raw prawns. <laughs> so I came off afterwards and they all rushed back and I thought, oh, I felt so glamorous. I was a lot older than most of them, but I didn't feel it, you know. And this little boy came up to me and he said, uh, he seemed like a little boy, he was a soldier, he couldn't have been that small. He said, gee, wait till I write and tell Mum I saw you. Uh. She always used to make me watch your shows. <laughs> <laughs> But they, but they were so young, you see. That's the oh, trouble. Yeah. They're, they're all kids in wars, aren't they? Yeah. They're the ones who, who get killed. Did you get very emotionally involved in it? I suppose you, it was inevitable. That we you were asked. very busy. I mean, you are busy when you go to a war. Mm. Particularly if you had to go for a few weeks. Yes. <laughs> you got to do a lot of things. Uh, yes, you would get a bit emotional. There was one particular song I sang, which uh, I'll never forget, because at the end of it, I didn't realise it was their special song of the war, and I had a very good arrangement done of it. And... Uh, as I finished singing it, I looked down, they were all crying. I thought, oh, oh, goodness, so I was crying. So we all had a good cry. And afterwards they came around, I said, I'm sorry, I'll never sing that again. They said, oh, please, always sing it. We love it, it's our favorite song. Yes. And I said, well, don't cry. They said, it makes us happy. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you got, of course, the MBE for that, didn't you? For Well, I think they had to give one to somebody. Yeah, I see. No, truly, because a lot of people did such wonderful things and they probably tossed up and I got it. And, and how did you, how did you, were you notified of that? Well, it went to the wrong address, uh -huh. you see, and I didn't know anything about it. In the meantime, I'd been getting these letters from some nut in Canberra on rather official-looking paper. And I was reading these crazy letters and I thought, oh, goodness me, nut again. So the phone rang one day and this gentleman said, hello, uh, I'm calling from Canberra. I thought, it's the nut. <laughs> the nut on the phone. He said, I'm calling to see uh, if you will accept the MBE. I said, oh, of course, darling, I'll have two. 
And then I, gradually it dawned on me it was for real. So uh, I said, oh, I'm sorry, well, if you're serious, he said, yes, we are serious. He said, I've got to get the word back to, to Betty Windsor and all those people <laughs> to say you'll have it. I said, yes, I'll, thank you. I think I got John Lennon's reject. It was a bit <laughs> screwed up, actually. I'm sure you didn't. Well, it's in any case. Lorraine Desmond for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Lorraine Thanks. Desmond. We'll be back in a moment to meet Rowena Wallace. We'll see you after this break. Now, television serials have contributed to our cultural and intellectual development. One of them posed the great question of our age. Who shot J.R.? There were many number of suspects who had good reasons to pot him. It's uh, his extreme unpleasantness that's made him hypnotically appealing to large numbers of people. On Australian TV, Patricia from Sons and Daughters almost makes JR appear benevolent by comparison. Her fans know her as Pat the Rat or the Lacquered Tarantula. In real life, she's much more pleasant than that. Rowena Wallace. What's the worst reaction you've had to Pat the Rat? I've only had one really bad reaction, and I didn't get it personally, actually. Uh -huh. It was down in Melbourne when we were filming OBs down there, and we were working at a truck depot, and uh, the crew and the rest of the cast were there very early in the morning, but I had a late call, and I arrived about 11 o'clock, and they said, oh, thank goodness you didn't come any earlier. I said, why? They said, there was this truck driver who came by and said, is that Patricia Hamilton here? <laughs> and they said, well, actually, no. Well, good for her, because if she was, I'd smash her face in. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. A real fan. And off he drove. <laughs> but it must be, of course... Nice man. It must be great fun to play a strong part like that. It is. Yeah. It's a challenge, and it, it's meaty. It gives you something to work with. And you can get away with all sorts of things. Well, like smoking. Like smoking and <laughs> drinking, all of that. All yes, of that she stuff. never stops. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And I suppose uh, there's a great change from the, from the ordinary run-the-mill roles that uh, an actress gets offered. Well, it, it was for me, because yeah. I've, I've spent many years of my 17 professional years in the business playing understanding destroyed wives and uh, <laughs> the jealous girlfriend and, and then another understanding mother and then another defeated mother and then another mother who accepts it all and then another mother. And so it went on. Uh, one played out the clichés of these types of roles, and it got to the stage where you thought, oh, no, not another one. What do I do with it? What do I do with it? Mm. So when the time came that I began to be offered these, these sort of roles, I was thrilled. Mm. Going back to those early days, you started in, in your first sort of big break, in a sense, was in Brisbane on television, wasn't it? What, do you, what did you do there? What, what was your job at the station? I did many things. I was a Jill of all trades and, and master of absolutely nothing. I joined Channel 7 in Brisbane as... Um, Initially, as a straight girl on a show called Theatre Royal, which was transferred from the actual Theatre Royal in Brisbane to television, and they called it Theatre Royal, and it went live to air on a Friday night at 7.30, I'll never forget. I used to die every Friday night. <laughs> and I was hired as a what they called a soubrette in those days. And she used to come on and sing a song with the ballet, sing a couple of choruses and a verse, and then do a routine with all the feathers and the spangled costume and all the rest of it. And I used to appear in the gags with George Wallace, Jr. Mm -hmm. But what were you doing on the TV station as well, apart, as a, apart from that? Wasn't that enough? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, all right. Um, well, eventually they thought, well, she's got a lot of spare time, we can do something with her. So I became a booth announcer, which was announcing all the commercials and logging all the commercial times in the booth, because they've got machines to do all that now. Mm. We were like machines. We used to have, what's that soundproofing with all the holes in it? Soundproofing. Soundproofing. Yes. That's right. You're right. Yes. Like, yes. Soundproofing. Yes. Soundproofing. Yes. Yes. Just a pretty face. Yeah. I draw. I drew lines. I linked up every hole in the sound booth. I went mad. <laughs> I hosted a children's show, an afternoon children's show. I did an afternoon news bulletin, and I was the weather girl. The weather girl. Mm. And you used to do all this at the same time, did you? Not all at once. No, not no. all at once. I know that. I mean, you go from what one studio to another, changing. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Theatre Royal being live to air on Friday night, came very shortly afterwards, after the weather report. And on a Friday night, I used to get into little Studio B and I'd have all my hair teased up. This was the 60s, of course. Mm. Or remember what we looked like then. Terrible. <laughs> and I'd have a, a nice straight suit on with a sort of frilly blouse to cover everything up. 
And underneath that would be the spangled costume, and those <laughs> high-cut numbers, and the mesh stockings and the high heel shoes, the elastic over the top. And I'd do the weather report. <laughs> and I would hair out of that studio, down to the dressing room, take off the suit, rip out the hair, throw on the feathers at the back and thing the, and rush up to Studio A as the curtain was drawing the past. <laughs> <laughs> Ta-da! Oh, so, oh, I, like I do get carried away. Yes, sorry, everyone. Uh, it sounds like a recipe it's for... Only water. What do you know? It sounds like a recipe water. for a disaster. Oh, that's it was, right. sometimes. <laughs> the first night I did it, the first night I did Theatre Royal, I forgot the routine. And I was in the front row, so I couldn't watch anybody. I stood there and cried. <laughs> <laughs> In your, in, your, in your career, you've had in television, it was 17 years, and you, you say you've been uh, mm. doing it. You've had a couple of, uh, of sort of historical moments, haven't you? I mean, I, I mean Pat, this character you play now, is, is historical in the sense that it's, it's the first true nasty, you know, the, the one that yes. they love to hit. There was another thing that you did in a, in a thing called You Can't See Around Corners, too, wasn't there? There was another historical moment. That scene? The scene. Yes. Hey, what, what, tell us about the scene. Well, it, it was, uh, let me remember, a scene in the park where uh, Frankie's off to war, that's right, and it's our last night together, and he wants to make the most of it. But uh, Margie is not of the same mind. And uh, so they sort of wrestle around in the grass for a bit. But unbeknownst to me, the director and Ken Shorter, who played Frankie, had got together in a corner and decided that they would go a little further than we had rehearsed. So he put his hand up my skirt and got a wonderful reaction. Did he? It was very real. <laughs> oh, so let's, we've got the clip here. Let's have a look oh, at it now. Come on, this will remind you all our golden oldies. Here we go. Look, we probably won't see each other again, maybe for a long time. Don't, let's muck it up. before no go on no we weren't well we won't <laughs> no let's don't what talk about step-ins why because we haven't rehearsed it well it doesn't matter <laughs> we haven't rehearsed any of it i mean what's, what's what about, what about step-ins would it be a, a, a terrific embarrassment to you if i if i press the point i think it might be would it yes. be as mm. big an embarrassment as it was when he pressed the point um <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> all right fine <laughs> Yes. Next question. Well, all right. Well, what kind of reaction did... I mean, that caused a terrible thing at the time. Well, it did, and, and there was a certain amount of deliberation, of course. Uh, it was the first episode of the series, and, of course, Channel 7, ha, I said it, wanted everybody to watch, and they did. And <laughs> they did, yeah. <laughs> so it was terrific. It got the series off to a good start. Well, what are the... say with the Big Bang. <laughs> yes, the Big Bang, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love the music, the climactic <laughs> yes, music. Yes, it's yes. marvellous. Let me ask the, out. the two of you, what kind of censorship problems have you, have you had? Have you had any censorship problems at all? Well, I've found that in America they're terribly stuffy about oh, yes. things like yes, that. Yes, they are. Mm. I mean, that the little clip with Jack uh, that was there, I, that, I had a green sequin dress. That dress was green. It was in black and white, though, so long ago, uh, which I've worn all over the place. I've worn it in England. I've worn it in Australia. I got to America to do the Jack Benny show and they had put a bit of mesh across there because they you know, didn't want to expose the Rudy Valley. Mm. They're, they're extremely prudish, aren't they? And yet, you, you know, you see scenes of explicit violence there, which, I mean, they're just allowed to go on unchecked. But, I mean, That's they right. had sort of uh, Rudy Valley, as you it's say. It's a silly double standard. It is a silly double standard. I did a, a series called The Rovers, which was a kid show, and I played um, a, a journalist, uh, Rusty, we used to call her Trusty Rusty and, and Hero Bob. And they lived on a, a schooner with uh, the captain and koalas and wombats and cockatoos <laughs> and all sorts of things. Well, they all lived there, but Rusty didn't. She used to appear bright and bubbly every morning, ready to set to right all the wrongs and uh, do all those wonderful things. But we never knew where she went at night. We decided <laughs> she, did, she couldn't live on the boat. 
<laughs> that was out of the question. So we figured either she went up the cross every night <laughs> or she lived up the mast <laughs> in the rose nest, sort of permanent lookout. <laughs> but there she'd be on deck every morning, ready yeah. to go. One of life's great on mysteries. On her crusade, yes, yeah. we never found out. Yeah. Can I ask the two of you too, I mean, what about the, the both of you from very early age had an ambition to, to make it, and you've both made it. Uh, um, you're both uh, divorced. Um, is that anything to do with the job itself? Is there a pressure on a, on a woman becoming successful, do you think, that uh, makes it difficult to have a, a settled married life? Uh, it is a bit hard to get to see the person you'd be living with, I think, <laughs> yes. for a start, you know. Um, I think doing this sort of show, it is very, would be very, very hard on a marriage, but I'm not saying that uh, it would, would wreck it, because that depends on the two individuals. I'm having a lovely time being single. You are? Oh, certainly. I can turn the light out when I like. I can get a, be really selfish. Really? Mm, it's lovely. Yeah, yeah. Do you have to learn to be more assertive, Lorraine? I mean, one should be able to turn the light out whenever one wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Do you turn the light out? <laughs> Never goes on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a lovely time being single. You are. Yeah, but it, it's a difficult job for relationships. It's a difficult job to have a social life with because is. you really never know when you're going to be free. And uh, it's, it's not just the actual working from seven to seven or yeah. nine to five, whatever it is, during the day, but you get home at night and you, you know, you've really had it, and, but you've got to prepare for the next day and weekends you have to set time aside. So it's, uh, there's a kind of discipline involved that makes it difficult to yes. just do what you really want to do. Yes. To make an appointment is so yes. hard. Yes, yeah. I mean, I say to people, look, could you ring me next Tuesday and I'll let you know what the schedule's after the week after and I'll let you know how much I've got to learn and what times I am available. You can't really make an appointment for ages ahead, mm -hmm. which is pretty hard on a romantic situation. Yeah, because nobody really understands that no, either, they do they? No. Do, do, do you think, think you're giving them a line? Do you think, do, just please though, do you think that men are also, when they see the, the character of you, do you think they're a bit frightened of you? Is that what it is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> do you think it could well, be I, that? I don't know. I mean, you meet people and they react to you and you accept that. Um, I suppose it could be. I mean, I think it's rather silly, but I suppose that could be an element. Mm. It's worth a try, isn't it? Isn't it? Yes, <laughs> yes. If they send the letters to me, not to you, though. Right. <laughs> yes. Rowena Wallace, for the moment, thank you very much indeed. Rowena Wallace. <laughs> Television series are much more than fiction or entertainment to a lot of people. They become real-life stories and the characters in them become flesh and blood. Before Lorraine Desmond became Australia's favourite mum, the title was held by my next guest in one of the most successful of all Australian series, The Sullivans. Grace Sullivan was killed in the London Blitz, but the actress who played her survived as Jennifer Carson in Carson's Law. Ladies and gentlemen, Lorraine Bailey. You, of course, were a by comparison, a, a late starter into the theatre. You were, what, five when you started, weren't you? <laughs> Four and a half. Four and a half. <laughs> no, three, actually, with the Salvation Army. Well, I see. Oh, the Sally. You used to follow the Sally, did you? No, uh, yes. Um, I was given a, <laughs> no, a yes, tambourine <laughs> for Christmas uh, when I was three, and uh, the Salvation Army used to go around, and so I just joined them one day and was, went missing, so to speak, and I was found following them with my tambourine. Uh -huh. And what about the, the, sort of the proper stuff, though? I mean, you used to do a vent act, didn't you, when you were very young? No, well, my father was a policeman, just like Carson's Law, and, uh, but he, uh, as well, he was uh, an amateur magician and ventriloquist. Yeah. So he taught me um, how to do ventriloquism with the doll. And how old were you when you were doing this? Oh, I think from about five onwards. I know the doll was as big as I was, or a little bit bigger. Jerry, yes. his name. He had red hair yeah. and a white costume with purple pom-poms. And how did you, uh, can you remember the act? No, I can remember uh, the song was Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. But, um, I mean, that was 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> you can't remember the voice at all? Yeah, yes, yes, I do. yes, a little bit. Do you want to hear something? Yeah, 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 yeah. go on. Go well, on. I, well, I have to put my hand well, up. Of course, well, that's, that's, <laughs> that's Jerry, sure. Well, yeah. Jerry, you'd have to hold it. This is, this is Jerry. <laughs> this, right, is, this, is Jerry. <laughs> this is Jerry. But well, you know, see, that's you, right, that's Jerry. But you have to look at Jerry, because when you're of doing course. ventriloquist act, I you, won't look you, it. you misdirect. Actually, 
Could you be my doll? Certainly. Can you smell her? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet Jerry. Will you put your hand up on the back? Oh, yes, yes, I'm going to there it is. But what you have to do when I'm singing is go like this. Right, ready? Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. Oh, how the world so high, like a diamond in the sky. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder what you are. <laughs> uh, Mind you, I'm a little rusty in case you hadn't noticed. <laughs> Bet you can't say Gulverhampton. <laughs> Gulverhampton. <laughs> Gulverhampton. It's the most difficult word for ventriloquist to say, isn't it? Where do you come from, my little man? Gulverhampton. Gulverhampton. <laughs> Can you say Wolverhampton, my lad, though? Wolverhampton. Oh, she's very good indeed. <laughs> Amazing, yes. She probably saw my lips, though. Yes. Now, what about the theatre, though? Because your, your your first ambition was to be a film star, wasn't it? Es oh, Esther Williams, was it? Yes, I wanted to be... Uh, this was also when I was about five of and course. living in the country and used to go to the movies, and Esther Williams was the big star at the time. Yeah. And, oh, I, you know, all this gold lame and all this backstroke and everything like this, and I used to swim, you see, so I'd get down to the pools and I'd do all this glamorous backstroke. Except I used to always bum my head because I could never see where I was going. <laughs> and I used to always wonder how in the movies she... Always looked so wonderful and just stopped at the right time without bumping <laughs> her head. And then I remember when I was about 12 years of age, uh, buying my first gold lame swimming costume. Oh, but that was I stunning. Thought, oh, I thought that was so glamorous. Knock them out of the local bus. <laughs> uh, no, nothing was knocked out when I was wearing it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was 12. To, <laughs> I used to fancy her, Esther Williams. She well, but really, when you think back, the musicals, the, the spectacle. Mm. Um, oh, they were lovely, weren't oh, they? Oh, magnificent. All and that I... coloured smoke and <laughs> dropping yeah. into the thing and trapezes and Busby Barker. Exactly. And, uh, it's like sex, you know, it was better in those days. <laughs> 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 it's better, honestly, because it's really. <laughs> no. I was yeah. waiting when you'd mentioned you. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> now, let's get, let's get on to something serious, serious business, the Sullivans. Isn't when it... sex? No, no, well, it's not. Oh, no, it's funny, we just established that, right? It was funny. Particularly for a ventriloquist. Um, <laughs> when you did the, when you got the part, did you realise, in fact, that it was going to be as successful, that part, as you... I mean, was it, did it appear to you to be a good, meaty part to have? In the Sullivans? Yes. When, uh, yes, I liked the script very much when mm. I first read it, because um, I thought it was a good role, it was an interesting woman, and I liked what the series was about, because it, um, it was part of history, and it was also able to communicate to people who perhaps didn't live through those years how people did feel mm. during that time and um, what they had to go through. And, and it was also a learning period for, for myself because um, I gained a greater respect for the people who had, had gone to war and the people who had to suffer through the war mm. um, because you just don't know unless you've lived through it. And I feel as if I almost have. Yes, um, it's playing in England, that, of that course, series. at present. I know, I get a lot of letters from England. Do you? Yes. Nice ones. Very, very nice letters, and um, I gather from the mail that I, I'm receiving that Grace is just about to be blown up. <laughs> oh, she <laughs> is. Yes. She's about to disappear from the series. I was that was that your decision to leave? Yes, it was. Um, Why? Nothing to do with the series at no. all, because I thoroughly enjoyed doing that, and I loved the role and, and um, the, the whole um, production. But it was just, as, as was being discussed earlier, it um, makes incredible demands on, on your private life. Mm. And um, after two and a half years, I just needed a bit more for my own personal life. Uh, that how, always comes through. Yes, I mean, how difficult is it, though, to, to make that decision? Because it was extremely difficult at the time, be. because mm. when you're enjoying the work mm. and you like the role, um, it was a very, very difficult decision. And um, I often think if maybe I'd had time off for a holiday, would I have taken it and gone back? But at the time, um, I had to make a decision within three months, and I, I just didn't know at that stage what, what to do, so... Uh, let me ask you what I asked, asked uh, Rainer and Lorraine as well. I mean, what kind of reaction do you get from, from people in the, in the street? Do you find that people assume that they know you, that you're their best friend and that sort of thing? Very nice reaction. Um, if, you know, it, it's nice to have somebody just say, Hello, Lorraine, as if they have known you for a long time, and it's very warm and it's very friendly, and you can't help but respond in kind. Uh, although, sometimes it can go a little far. I, mean, I can remember when I have been out to dinner with someone and you want to be with that person, but on two different occasions, I've had people actually 
come and join us. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we, we didn't have to pay as well. Oh, I can't remember who paid now. But, well, really, um, sort I mean, of sat it's, down. It's, uh, the, <laughs> yes. So you've got the double yeah, thing there of wanting to be with the person that you're with, but on the other hand, it's a pleasurable feeling to think that, well, they felt that warm and that they knew you, that they could just come and, and join you. <laughs> It's a real dichotomy, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes. I mean, have you had anybody join you for dinner or...? Yes. For, what, just sit down <laughs> yes. and say...? Often. Often? Yeah. Really? Oh, I've only often. had it twice. Oh, just come and sit down. Uh-huh. Kiss you soundly on both cheeks and sit down and order coffee. Oh, you've never seen them before? <laughs> no. What's your, what's your tactic with dinner with them? I just say hello and... Uh, what would you like for dessert? You, yes, <laughs> what are you going to do? I mean, you just go with it. Um, it is, as, as Lorraine said, it's a thing that they feel they know you, you belong to them. So yes. Uh, yes. it's just a bit hard, I think, if you're particularly fond of the fella you're with. He doesn't understand. <laughs> I think you're all crazy in any case to doing the job you're doing. I really do. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're all potty. Well, yeah. you are. Absolutely. You're 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 quite Absolutely. right. Absolutely. It's yeah. a lot easier to sit here talking to you than be there and going up on stage. That's what I mean. No, no, no. It's that's it's not. It's cushy for you. It's cushy for me, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 There are very, very, very well. enjoyable moments in it. There are. Yes. We'll talk about some of those in just a moment. Lorraine Belly for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. Lorraine Belly. But what's the worst moment that you've, uh, you've been through professionally? Best little whorehouse in Texas. Really? Yes, um, but yet it was also one of the most pleasurable as well because um, um, when Mike Walsh first asked me would I do it, and it was a musical, I thought, oh, yes, I'd love to. And I had colleagues ringing me up saying, don't, don't, you ruin your career. But I went ahead anyway because um, I'd never done one before and I wanted to learn. And um, so I started taking singing lessons and... Um, I wasn't sounding too bad in rehearsals. And then I made the mistake of thinking, well, the more you practice, the better you become. So I was having singing lessons in the morning, singing lessons at night, and rehearsing all day. And of course, I just wore my voice out. And then two days before the opening anyway, I caught some overseas virus that was going around. So I went on stage on opening night, and I had this virus, so I had diarrhoea and I was <laughs> vomiting and uh, between scenes, so it's true. You can imagine what it was like trying to perform. You'd come on and do a little bit and you'd think, I hope I can get through this bit, you know. <laughs> then race up to the toilet. Other members of the cast kept teasing me about disappearing up the corridor all the time. And this went on for, for the first five weeks and it was horrendous because you're on stage and you just, all I could remember thinking was, I hope I don't pass out. Or, and, and being so dizzy, I, I hope I don't fall over. And, you know, tr as well as trying to think of, of the song and, and the dialogue. And, you know, there were some nights when you just think, I hope nobody can see me. And it's a bit hard when you're centre stage and there's a thousand yeah, people there's out there. a big bumble yes. yeah. Mind you, there are other nights when I was good. Yes. I wasn't terrible all the time, just <laughs> some <of> the time. <laughs> And, Rowena, what about yours? What would yours be? <clears throat> I suppose the, the worst times for me are always those periods out of work. Because nobody ever thinks you're out of work. Because no. there are things on air that you've done years and years ago that you thought would never surface, but suddenly up they come. And you go and say, oh, but you're busy, aren't you? I haven't worked for eight months. Oh, well, we saw you on the telly. They're the worst times for me. Yes. You sit around waiting for the phone to ring, and you discover it's been cut off for the last <laughs> eight months. Is it very, do, you, do you get very depressed by it? I used to, not do so you? much anymore. Because yeah. I've been out of work for a while, so it's difficult to say. Yes. But, yes, mm. nobody wants you, nobody loves you, and you're useless and hopeless. Yeah. All that paranoia that sets in. Yes. Uh, you know, it's damage to the ego. That's what it is, yeah. basically. <laughs> but we're hopeless. Well, I am. Lorraine, what about you? Well, I'd been in the business for years and years and years, and suddenly I thought, well, gosh, you know, I've never, ever made a commercial. I still haven't made a commercial. Nobody wants me on commercial. <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, wouldn't it be lovely? Oh, well, I still haven't made one. And the phone rang from my agent and said, listen, there's a terrific commercial. It's very good money. I said, oh, what is it? And uh, he said, well, it's just one thing. It's um, the toilet paper. <laughs> I said, well, I've been in it so long, I don't think I want to go back and start at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't do it. You didn't do it. <laughs> Started the bottom. That sounded like a, like a really good line, that to me. It's true. It happened. Yeah. But, but what is it you see that <clears throat> that keeps you going, keeps you in this silly business that, that you've all chosen to be in, um, uh, when when things are bad? Masochistic, I suppose. Mm. You think so, do you? 
Um, well, I don't know anything else. I mean, I'm very new to this end of the business. Yes. I've been <laughs> back to ends again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've mostly been connected with music all my life, so this is a, just a wonderful, uh, fresh, new thing for me. Uh, and I love it. However, I don't know how you'd feel after quite a few years without a holiday, and I think that's a very interesting thing. We're getting a nice long holiday this year, and, I, and we all need it. Mm. Uh, I think if you're with a great cast and you're all having a good time, it, it's... it's there's more warmth and friendliness in working with a group because I've spent so, well, all those years alone, really. You know, just travelling around the world on my Todd. Mm. And it gets a bit lonely and I'm enjoying the company of being part of a company. Yes. Mm. Lorraine, what is it about, about it that keeps you going? I like um, um, changing um, characters. I love creating different characters and so even if I'm not in a series, I, I try and choose the roles that will um, use a different part of me. That's why I like doing different ages. Most of the things I've played are, have been older than me. And that's partly because if you're working on film, I hate worrying about makeup and hair and things. So if you're playing an older part and not very glamorous, you can in, enjoy the location without worrying. But it's, it's the little things, you know, like creating new characters and working in a company that you can really enjoy. Mm. And so even in a two hour a week series, naturally all the storylines that you're going to have to do aren't going to please you. Mm. But every now and again, something will come along that is just wonderful mm. and that you thoroughly enjoy doing and it can make it all worthwhile. Yeah, this thing about, you about disguise is interesting because I, I remember once did a, did a show with, with Peter Sellers and he actually called off the night before and I said, why won't you do the show? And he said, because I can't walk on as myself. <laughs> and I said angrily, well, walk on in bloody disguise then. And he said, can I? And he came on as a German officer. And it was yeah. the only way he could get on. It's quite extraordinary. He just could not walk on as himself. He couldn't that, walk again, down Again, those that's stairs. a different thing, though, oh, than purposely wanting and trying to put little pieces right. together to make a different character. Right, right. So it, it gives you the impression that a lot of actors are, are walking around looking for someone to be. Yes. You know, not yes. knowing in, innately deep down who they are or what they are. Yes. Which I suppose is everybody's problem, basically. But with actors, it seems to be more pronounced. So we go through this soul-searching process but of doing it in public of but also you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a creative outlet you know i mean musicians have their creative outlet ballet dancers have theirs and i think in our business um you can go on and play a straight role and play yourself right. if you want to <coughs> I can remember or times when it wasn't terribly creative actually <laughs> yeah, well, exa oh, exactly you have right. to. but then you can aim for that and you can look yeah. for it and, and try I, I find it so exciting to get different scripts every week yes and have somebody actually writing it for you and then you you play with the words that somebody's done all that work yes because normally if you go out and do it out by yourself on a stage you're left with finding all of that dialogue and the whole bit yourself because there's nobody to write it for you, so well, you do it yourself. The nice thing about this job, actually, apart from talking to the three lovely ladies like yourself, is, is actually finding again something else that, that you can do. Because, I mean, well, you work with everybody in, in this kind of job I do. Mm. And I've got a you great... See, I find that very interesting. Great, it's fascinating. Great futures of ventriloquist dumb. <laughs> that's what I do know. Absolutely. For, to, for that, I thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. Thank you. Lorena Wallace, Lorraine Bailey, thank you very much indeed for being my guest. Thank we'll you see much. you at the same time next week. Until then, from all of us here, very good night. Good night. Good night,